In case you missed my previous episodes, I have been on the quest to find the perfect Submariner. The Subby is one of those quintessential watches, kind of like a Seiko SKX or an Amiga Speedy or G-Shock Square, etc. And I mean, there are tons of examples, but these icons become something of a necessity, either to try or own in a collection during the journey as a watch enthusiast. I started my channel with the contemporary ceramic sub date, but then my tastes inevitably changed to more vintage watches, and I eventually settled on the Tudor 79079. Then, as part of the work I do outside of YouTube, I was hired as a director for a week in Italy on the idyllic Lake Como. After borrowing, owning, reviewing, and sharing almost a dozen different submariners in just about every color, era, and configuration, it was time to return to the Black Bay 58 and reevaluate my thoughts from a more experienced perspective. So I reached out to my go-to watch dealer, the highly reputable Moya Jewelers, and borrowed a used 58 to accompany me on this perfect Italian backdrop. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I apologize about my disheveled, very tired appearance, but I'm here at Lake Como. <laughs> Look at that, got the pool down there. Unfortunately, it's a bit too cold, but you can see the lake. There it is, let's zoom in, let's zoom in. There's the lake, and it runs all the way here, all the way down there. Look at this mountainous beauty. So obviously I'm here for work, uh, working on a really cool project. And nothing to do with YouTube. But yeah, it's amazing where YouTube takes you. <laughs> anyway, it's probably windy. The microphone is probably really soft. I'm going to get some sleep. Actually, I'm going to eat some pasta. <laughs> then I'm going to get some sleep. <laughs> As I have shared many videos diving deep into the history and evolution of the Tudor divers, today I will focus on my five likes and dislikes of the Black Bay 58 after a week on the wrist. So let's start with the positives. The number one thing I like is its scale and size. It's undoubtedly the most obvious thing about it and why the 58 has eclipsed the success of the first ETA-based Black Bays from the then newly rejuvenated brand in 2012. The 58 hit dealers' watch shelves in 2018, answering the call of many watch fans like myself who were put off by the progenitor's oversized chunkiness. Let's not forget, the watch world back in 2012 was still at the tail end of the big is better trend. It's no secret, the more slender, classic proportions not only make the watch wear like the heyday of Tudor's illustrious Submariner past, but also returns a sense of class boosted comfort and classical elegance while still managing to be reassuringly hefty, masculine and very solid feeling. It's amazing how a few millimetres here and there make the world of difference, even evoking more Bondian Dr. No Big Crown vibes, perhaps one of the highest aspirations a diver can have. I've got all my uh, Carl Friedrich gear, look at that, the perfect travel collection. I didn't end up upgrading to the uh, the Pro, this is fine for me because I take my laptop on the plane. I was actually editing a video for, for YouTube on my laptop. And then I had the weekend bag as well, so um, because we are going to do trips to Switzerland and stuff, obviously work related. One really cool thing about Carl Friedrich, they were recently um, featured in a TV show, I forget the name, but Brian Cox is in it, uh, the, the original Hannibal Lecter before Anthony Hopkins took over. Uh, he was also in Frasier. He's in a ton of things. Love that actor. But there's a there's a screenshot. They shared it on their Instagram. So it's cool that Carl Friedrich is getting the 
recognition. Sorry about the planes. There's uh, people landing planes on the on the lake. <laughs> So, with the obvious out of the way, the second thing I deeply appreciate, and have to mention, is its performance. While the aesthetics is unapologetically vintage, the quality, standard of finishing, materials and mechanics are all inherently modern. When the Black Bay first landed, many, including myself, suspected Tudor had made the case larger to future-proof themselves, as eventually an in-house movement would arrive. Then that came into fruition in 2016, after the more dedicated Uber 2 watch, the Tudor Palagos, got the upgrade first a year previously. Inside the 58 is the highly impressive proprietary made automatic caliber MT5602. A certified chronometer, it features an extremely practical 70 hours power reserve, but most importantly, still maintaining a smooth sweeping high 28,800 vibrations per hour. It is equipped with a bi-directional rotor system, a variable inertia balance, micro-adjustment by screws, and that full traversing balance bridge for extra stability. All architectural traits of modern Rolex movements, and what makes them so damn rock solid and reliable. It also features a massively useful non-magnetic silicon balance spring to deal with the ever more watch magnetizing digital world, and finished in an understated, contrasted, bead and brushed finish with high polished beveling. Not to mention a handsome skeletonized rotor. What can I say? Pure class indeed. So you're probably wondering what watches I brought with me. Well, I never travel without my Pepsi GMT there, especially for international uh, journeys. Uh, over here we have the Black Bay, obviously, that I'm making a video about. Uh, to compare it, my vintage Tudor Sub, my favourite watch of all time, the Squire 39 Atmos. Um, sorry, Sub 39 there, my limited edition. It used to be the Rolex Explorer, my favourite watch, but obviously this is a lot more personal and kind of superseded it. Took the throne. Uh, my beta watch is the Mission Impossible, my favourite Casio on the Italian Bandiera. Uh, strap by NDC, lovely little personalized strap, Sh shout out to them. Um, for a bit of extra fun, the Fortis, because, well you know what, with all these hot releases from the brand, uh, I really thought I'd take this. Got some new straps from Risk Candy Watch Club to test out. This is their fantastic rubber straps and they really are excellent. Um, can't recommend them enough, they got a bunch of colors. So I'm really chuffed. I was a little bit trepidatious because I love my Bonetto Cinturini straps, but these ones absolutely work wonderfully, especially for the smaller wrist. Uh, I put it on Explorer, I tested it. I got the um, Valor Mark II. I think this really will complement the good old um, Black Bay there. And I forget this one. So on my person, I have the Carl Friedrich Unico. And then the rest of the watches I have in this Seiko prospect case there. The third aspect I deeply admire about the 58 is the overall design and style. While there are some things I think they got fundamentally wrong, more on that later, generally the mix of matte black, subdued gold markings, flashes of high polished gilt and medallion yellow gold print all works wonderfully in cohesion. The pop of slightly metallic cherry red on the bezel again accentuates its 6538 vibes in conjunction with the unguarded exaggerated crown, beautifully completed with the British Royal Tudor Rose. This watch defines the urban gentry phrase of being an absolute strap monster. No matter if it is rubber, NATO, bracelet, leather, or if you really want to be historically accurate, the real deal parachute strap from NDC, as used by the Marine Nationale, they all work flawlessly with this watch. This versatility extends to compatibility with attire. I feel I could sport this while being super casual in a tracksuit, the most comfortable way to fly, FYI. Just as much as when suited and booted in more formal attire, or casual smart, like my recent watch talk episode with the legendary Duncan Casey, himself a former 58 owner. More on that in that video if you missed it. The absence of date complication also keeps the perfect orientation of the luminescence unbroken and brings a pleasing sense of symmetry to the dial. As somebody who wears only yellow gold jewellery, like my wedding ring, signet ring and necklace, the gilt does lend itself to being slightly more, albeit very subtly, 
compatible with my accessories. Not quite on the level of two-tone watches, but it is a good start and I adore how the gilt glistens when it catches the light. It achieves something all great watches aspire to, that do-it-all, any situation adaptability. From the pool on vacation, real professional diving, or in the boardroom meeting at work, all corners are covered. So day two, and as you can see, it's clouded over, but it's still beautiful. Uh, waking up with this view is just, it's stunning. <laughs> I'm about to post a video for you guys, so even though I'm working, I'm still working. <laughs> I even like the clouds. I mean, look how look how low they are. You can't see the sky. These mountains are so tall. Um, it's gorgeous. So we are actually venturing into some of these mountains uh, today to look for shooting locations. So yesterday I was very, very jet lagged. Finally got a good night's sleep. I did wake up a few times did some work and then went back to sleep. Uh, but tonight I think I should have first proper night's sleep. Yesterday, the first day was kind of, you know, I was uh, un po' fuori di testa yesterday, um, out of my mind with tiredness <laughs> because I hadn't slept for 24 hours. Uh, but then you adjust and we were just going around Lake Como, scouting locations. Today, uh, my actor friend arrives, you know who you are. Uh, it's all a bit hush hush because uh, yeah we're not supposed to talk about the project but um, very exciting and yesterday I did meet the camera guy, the main camera guy, immensely talented, uh, shout out to Simone. Today we actually start work so yesterday was kind of prepping. Um, I don't know if I can get some watch content in but oh god look at that view, it's just stunning. Let's go outside, let's have a look. thing I love about this watch, and this goes for any Tudor for that matter, and especially their divers, is unequivocally history. I previously borrowed a no-date reference 7928 with that emblematic Tudor rose on the dial from the mid-1960s. That watch was the first Tudor to be officially issued to the US Navy and was the start of decades of military involvement, again all covered extensively in previous videos. Most famous is, of course, the blue reference 9401 that was important not only for its storied legacy as the choice of the Marine Nationale during the 1970s, but with the introduction of the now iconic snowflake handset and corresponding markers on the dial. The shift in design language finally steered the Tudor sub on a new path, away from under the shadow of its bigger brother Rolex, with its own more distinctive identity. This is carried on in the Black Bay, with the hands, but then mixed with the classical triangle, circle and rectangular marker layout of the 1950s subs. The cleverly hidden shield that makes up the perfectly constructed clasp and refined ceramic ball bearing latch reminds me of the link to British history every time I use it. Hans Wilsdorf's passion and fascination for British history was no secret, and aside from me growing up in northern Italy, the rest of my time was in England a place where the Tudor's royal dynasty's influence is inescapable when it comes to culture, architecture, art, or the effects on political, religious, social, and economic influence. This all set England on a path for growth and conquest that would shape the world we live in today. In fact, historian John Guy in 1988 argued that England was economically healthier, more expansive, and more optimistic under the Tudors than any time since the Roman occupation. So aside from Tudor watches having far more military provenance compared to Rolex, the Rose and Tudor name mean a great deal to me. Okay, a few observations about the crown. First of all, it's got a really pleasingly buttery smooth feel, a million miles away from the standard ETA like the uh, subby over there. Um, also, it's beautifully ergonomic because of that huge oversized scale. 
Bezel is 60 click, very, very reassuringly solid, snappy. Nothing has changed compared to the uh, 41, pleasingly um, accurate and yeah, just great, great bezel action there. Uh, a million miles away from the bi-directional old days, so this is unidirectional. My fifth and final thing I like about this 200 meter rated diver is, well, yeah, value for money. Especially when you consider the level of true luxury feeling and quality you get, it cannot be ignored. Priced at a fraction of the cost of a Rolex sub that you can't actually buy, and substantially less than Rolex's greatest nemesis, the contemporary Amiga Seamaster, the 58 is now widely available, unlike during its initial release. While it is not exploding in value like my OG Tudor Subby, its value retention is healthy, and if you do not go for it, you're not going to lose a ton of money if you change your mind. So, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, it is day three. I'm somewhere up there usually. Um, yesterday was very rainy, we were filming indoors. Uh, fantastic weather today, however. I mean, just look at that sky. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully I'll be able to vlog a little bit more. Yesterday was a bit hectic, although afterwards, me and the film crew, we went to um, one of the old, no, the oldest restaurant in Lake Como. It was fantastic. I had wild boar and polenta uh, and yeah I didn't do any wristwatch checks so I just wanted to you know share the experience and get to know everybody and it's a fantastic bunch of guys really really talented and today we'll be outside we're gonna film it at um, I forget where are we filming my memory is failing me now I've only had four hours sleep <laughs> because I wanted to get to the gym early all of this kind of stuff. I just wish it was summer. I'm coming back in summer because I want to use this pool. Imagine working here, getting paid to do what you love, wear amazing watches. Oh, by the way, I haven't done wristwatch yet, look. It's the uh, Black Bay 58 there. Yeah, just testing it out, enjoying it. So what are the negatives? Well, let's start with what I dislike about the design. The mix of snowflake hands without the matching square hour markers on the dial does bother me. Look at how well it works harmoniously on the Palagos, for example, especially in the newly launched No Date FXD. I love Mercedes hands, and in my opinion, they would have worked much better with this traditional Submariner marker set dial we see currently in the 58, even more so in guilt, I feel. Sure, if that had happened, many would complain, saying it would be too much like the subs of old, but Tudor started out its diving legacy only a year later compared to Rolex in 1954, so it is well within its rights to use the Mercedes handset. In fact, if anyone can, it is Tudor. Either go full snowflake or not at all. But that is perhaps my own pet peeve. The other faults in its design are the faux rivets on the bracelet and complete lack of diver extension. Both missed opportunities, the latter for obvious practical reasons. The former, and I have said this before, could have been utilized to feature a stretchable expanding bracelet, like the vintage oyster bracelets of the era that this watch is primarily drawing inspiration from. This would have corrected both bracelet flaws simultaneously and also added extra comfort, along with being easier to put on and take off the wrist. Making the head of the screwable pins in the links rounded to match the rivets would have also been a nice touch. One thing you certainly uh, don't have to worry about is uh, when it comes to value is mucking it up. While this is a lot easier and, and more affordable to maintain because of that ETA, um, the parts are more expensive on the rest of the watch and also with the exploding value of these vintage subs, um, you don't have to worry so much with these new pieces. I also think they both look better a little bit, you know, worn in. So. I'm not too worried. I, I'm not the type to worry about actually wearing my pieces to death. My second big dislike is shared by many vintage inspired watches. The 58 is all about trying to recreate the glory of the past, but with superior present day materials and mechanics. 
This is perfectly fine in theory, but sometimes in practice it leaves the resulting final product a little too cold in personality, or worse, mismatched and even confused. Thankfully it's not that bad here. Many times it's the imperfections that create character. Just look at spider dials, faded Pepsi bezels, old horribly jingly jangly jubilee bracelets, or in my case, with my dear old subby, tinny clasps and dated diver extensions, along with top hat style plexiglass crystals. These are just some examples, I'm sure you can think of many more in the comments, so please do share that. And it is indeed strange saying this, but I'm almost favouring the vastly inferior past here. But the same could be said about cars. Cars today all look the same to me, soulless, uninspired and ubiquitous, especially when compared to the obviously antiquated but majestic beauty of, let's say, a 1950s Cadillac, for example or even a Back to the Future 1980s DeLorean. At least they kept the aluminium bezel insert, I guess, and gave it somewhat of a stepped edge on the curved sapphire that does go some way to capture the vintage vibes. The addition of spring bar holes would have also elevated the watch for easier strap changes, but again, perhaps that is my own preference. Check out this view. So we're going to the restaurant behind me, just there. There it is. And it's called Una Finestra Sul Lago. The lago is, of course, the lake. So it's a window on the lake. And we're shooting here today uh, a little bit with uh, Duncan. Sorry about the light. Oh, nice lens flare there. Anyway, I've got to put a mask on and we're going to go inside. Okay, I press record here. Okay, you're picking up Fab Perfect. Fabio. Yeah, Fabio. <laughs> Get out. Get out. <laughs> Get out. Do it. Get <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, ready? Uh, All right, so to coordinate on one, two, three. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so I'll do my standard intro. Oh, airplane, yeah. This guy is going to be taking off. We'll put that in the, uh, the outtakes. Landing. He's up there. Look. He's up there. In the slowest. Oh, way. look at that. <laughs> You're ever <laughs> The Fiat Punto. <laughs> or don't, the, don't or, make, or, or the Ford car. That's not. The, uh, <laughs> I would. I wouldn't make jokes about Italian cars no, in Italy. No. <laughs> Probably not a good yeah, idea. The Punto is a well, you know, loved but slow car. I think. As is the the Panda. And yeah, well, I owned the Panda. Well, my Panda's parents had a Panda car. when I was indestructible. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember my dad ramming other people just to park his car with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back, back and forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. My final dislike of this timepiece is not the actual watch itself, but rather the hype surrounding it. There are some watches synonymous with celebrities, movies, and even cultural stereotypes. The Rolex President is a perfect exemplification of this. The 58, unfortunately, has become somewhat emblematic of a new generation of watch hipster and also influencer, a term I am not fond of, as these are often not real watch enthusiasts like you or me, or even using the watch to gain attention for their own online watch stores. This combined with the lack of magic spark that, without a shadow of a doubt, I feel in my vintage sub with the reasons I previously discussed with its design, leaves the 58 off my list of watches to buy, which, truthfully, is a good thing money-wise. But don't get me wrong, this is still a cracking watch, one of the best out there, in fact, and as you've just heard and seen, the positives outweigh the negatives substantially. Back in the war room, although I am missing Italy already, uh, a lot of you may not know that I actually lived in Italy for about seven years, but I will be returning. Prossimo anno, ci vediamo tutti in Italia. Um, what else? Yeah, I'm gonna go get some sleep. I'm deliriously tired. Uh, but before I go, please do add your thoughts, comments, experiences, likes, dislikes of the Tudor 58 in the comments, please. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, and I will catch you in the war room, hopefully in the next one. Okay, ciao.